Hey WCC, here's what's coming up. Our annual pool party is tonight at 6.30 p.m. Come enjoy a relaxing evening at Progress Park. WCC's Next Steps class for anyone looking for what their next step may be is next Sunday, August 21st. Registration is open for this year's women's one day conference called Gather, and it's going to be happening in September. Life groups are a vital part of WCC, and a new life group season launches on September 11th when we begin our Core 52 initiative. If you're not in a group yet, please join us for the Life Group Connection event on Sunday, August 28th. You can sign up for all of these on your connection card and check out our info on winsfieldcc.org slash events. Hey, good morning again and welcome to Wentzville Christian Church. My name is Randy Diebel. I'm the Connections Minister here at WCC and we are so glad you can join us today uh, for this series as we continue in Messy Church in 1 Corinthians. Uh, Keith will be looking at the end of 1 Corinthians today, 1 Corinthians 15 and 16, and we want to look at the end to keep the end in mind as we, we look at the middle coming up here. Uh, we also want to share that we had an amazing VBS this, this past week. Uh, one of the, yeah. And we had over, over 330 kids throughout the week. Uh, the short number, I think it was over 350 kids, actually. I think it was a little low. Uh, and we had over 175 different volunteers. So we're so thankful for that. Wonderful Friday night. Uh, again, come out tonight for the, the pool party to celebrate. And also, you have a treat where some of the kids are going to sing this morning. Uh, but if today is your first Sunday here, if you would take a minute and fill out a connection card, uh, you can find that in the back of the chair in front of you. Or uh, if you can fill it out online at wentzvillecc.org. Uh, that helps us keep up with everything. And again, if it's your first Sunday, if you turn in at our connection counter, we'd love to give you a small gift just as a thank you for checking us out today. But to jump into 1 Corinthians 15 in the service, let's read from 1 Corinthians 15, starting in verse 1, if you'll stand with me. Starting in verse 1, now brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel you are saved if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you. Otherwise, you have believed in vain. For what I received I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. And we will continue in that as we go here, that we know that our faith is built on Christ's resurrection. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for today. Thank you for uh, your word and Lord for your son. And Father, as we dive into the sermon later today and get into this service, help us just to come before your throne in praise and honor and know that we have hope because of the resurrection of Jesus. We love you in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Continue to stand as we worship our King and our Savior this morning. A sing of his love. Come on, you weary. Come on.
blessings flow. Praise Him, praise Him for the wonders of His love. Sing that out. Praise him this morning, church. Amen. Yes. He deserves all the praise and all the glory and all the honor. Would you sing this with me? Were creation suddenly articulate with a thousand tongues to lift one cry? From north to south and east to west, we'd hear Christ be magnified. Were the whole earth echoing his eminence, his name would burst from sea and sky. Christ be magnified. Oh, Christ be magnified. Let his praise arise. Christ be magnified. I'll be crucified with you Cause death 
Church, thank you again for being here, for gathering together as a body this morning. Right now would be a great time to go to winsfieldcc.org slash give. You can give your tithes and offerings. You can also drop it in any of the boxes at the communion table on your way out today along with that connection card. Well, I can tell you're not paying attention to anything that I say anymore. We had an amazing week of VBS, and uh, we are bringing some of those kids out for you to, uh, to hear what they have learned uh, this week. So I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Connor, our elementary minister. Would you guys give these guys a hand? Good morning, church. Whoa. That was a louder mic than I had a VBS. So good morning, guys. Um, for some of you that have helped out this past week, we had VBS for our kids. Um, some of you recognize these kids, but uh, all week we were just talking about how God is uh, always there and always loves us and is with us everywhere, uh, that he is surprising, that God is stronger than anything, and that he is always in charge. Uh, and so these kids were learning uh, that all week. And so we had a, we had a theme 
theme song called Always Will. Uh, some of you might know that song, some of you don't, and that's totally fine. Um, but this song really talks about Jesus' love for us and how he's always chasing us and always will be who he is. So we wanted to share that with you this morning. So uh, these kids are not doing this themselves. So adults, I would love for you guys to stand up and worship with us one final time. It is okay. You guys won't know the dances, but we will have the lyrics. So we would love for you to worship along with our kids this morning. Thank you.
right? Hey, good morning. Hey, let's give them another hand. They're still in the hallway back there. Yeah, let's. Good job. It was a great, great VBS. Connor and Cindy, Cindy, Sydney, excuse me, and Amanda uh, did a phenomenal job, and uh, obviously 100 plus uh, volunteers making it happen last week. So we had a, a great time. Thanks for celebrating and worshiping with us as we celebrate that end of the week and as we uh, continue to learn from this. So you've probably had some moments in your life uh, where you either you either thought this or you said this, where, where you just look at something or something happened, you're like, this changes everything thing, right? There's simple moments like that, like when Taco Bell comes out with a brand new burrito, right? I mean, it changes everything. It's like th- there's this cheese and this meat and this, well, it's pretty much always the same ingredients, but it's a new burrito, right? It changes everything. Or, or you get the new phone that's coming out, the new latest, greatest phone that comes out. It's got 16 cameras on it. And you're like, this changes everything. What does it do? I don't know, but it changes everything, right? Or there's big things, really complex things like marriage, right? Maybe when you got married, you're like, this changes everything, right? You have your first kid, changes everything. Remember as young parents or parents to be, uh, when people would say it's going to change your life and you're just like, I don't want to hear that, but it's true. It changes everything, right? Or even hard things like a pandemic, it changes things. And so big or small, these events, these moments that change the way we understand or look at things, uh, they cause us to live differently, to have a renewed sense of hope or or maybe even a sense of, of dread at times. But the ultimate, the ultimate, this changes everything moment happened about 2,000 years ago when Jesus, who was crucified, who died on the cross, who was taken from that cross and placed in a tomb, And then the moment that changed everything, he rose from the dead. The resurrection is the ultimate. This changes everything. It's monumental. That was the theme of our VBS. In fact, the kids that were a part of our VBS, as well as the adults, that's something they were learning this past week. It changed everything. Well, we started this series last week called Messy Church, looking at the Apostle Paul and his letters to the church in Corinth. We're looking at 1 Corinthians. And last week we talked about the mess that is this church. And really it's no different than any church today, right? There's always messes in our world and that happens within the church. And so Paul is dealing with these messes in this letter. People were fighting, there were divisions in the church. It was messy. And, and Paul's addressing a lot of these messes throughout the letter. But I thought it would be good for us as we jump into this letter. Uh, again, we talked about it, kind of introed it last week. But I thought it'd be good for us to begin with the end in mind. And so as Randy said earlier, we're going to be looking at chapter 15 today. Uh, we're we're, we're going to be looking at chunks of chapter 15. Chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians is a hefty bit of theology and scripture, all right? I would encourage you to sit down and read through chapters 15 and 16 with a good study Bible and look at that. But we're going to look at some of it today, especially in regards to the resurrection. And so let's look at this idea that uh, in in Jesus was raised from the dead. They didn't know or didn't understand that not only was Jesus raised from the dead, but that they too would be resurrected. And so the big idea this morning is simply this. The resurrection of Jesus changes everything, including me. Changes everything, including me. And so today is really about good news, about Jesus and the gospel. So let's open up to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Uh, If you've got a Bible app, or if you don't have a Bible app or a Bible, uh, there's one in the seats there around you. Uh, You can also just look on your phone, Google 1 Corinthians 15, and it'll come up with a website, probably with that passage of Scripture for you to look at. So we're going to look at this first section called the gospel. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 will begin in verse 1. Paul writes, he says, Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel you are saved, if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you. Otherwise, you have believed in vain. Now, when we hear the term gospel, the the word simply means this, good news. And maybe when you hear the word gospel, you think of the gospel books like Matthew or Mark or Luke or John. Those specific uh, books give accounts of Jesus, of his life, what he accomplished, who he is. 
And so Paul, Paul is talking about something he specifically shared with them. He, and the way that he shared it, he even says he preached to them. He preached to them and they received it. In other words, they heard what Paul had to say about Jesus and they received it and they understood it. And now they, they stand on it. It's become the foundation of what they believe. It's become the foundation of their faith. And, and it's what saves them. And he writes, if, and that's a big if, by this gospel, verse 2 there, you are saved if you hold firmly to the word I preached. And so it's vitally important what we believe, what we hold on to when it comes to Jesus. There have been a lot of messes created in our world and throughout history of people chasing down different ideas about who Jesus is. Maybe you've heard some of those ideas. Oh, Jesus, he was a, he was a good man. He was moral. That's it, Right? Or maybe you heard that Jesus was a teacher and a rabbi and others kind of propped him up to be something else. Or maybe even he was a prophet, but not really the son of God. Those are ideas about Jesus that people have spread throughout the world that simply aren't true. And so Paul says, you need to hold firmly on to the gospel, what has been preached, what has been spoken about in regards to Jesus. The Old Testament and New Testament, don't add anything to them. Don't buy into false gospel stories about Jesus, crazy stories that people will claim are from lost books or crazy visions or that go against what the Bible says about Jesus. That's how cults are started. That's that's where messes are made. And so Paul says, you remember all this that I preached to you, what you accepted, what you hold on to, what you stand, stand on, hold firmly to it. Verse 3, Paul says, For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scripture, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, who is Peter, and then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James and to all the apostles. And last of all, he appeared to me also as to one abnormally born. And so Paul reiterates what he shared with them, that Christ died for our sins. Christ didn't die for his sins because he was sinless. He gave his life for us, that he was buried. The idea that he was buried confirmed that he really died on the cross that day, that he was raised that the resurrection really happened, that he really came back to life. And then in, in, in pushing that idea, he's, he's sharing with us there were witnesses. Not just a handful of witnesses, but hundreds of people, some still alive in this moment of Paul writing this letter, who saw Jesus after he'd risen back to life. Not just Peter, not just the 12 disciples, but hundreds of eyewitnesses. Then he also appeared to James, who's his earthly brother, and to the other apostles, and then to Paul. And he says this to one who's abnormally born. That's just the way that Jesus introduced himself on the road to Damascus, where he was struck blind, was a little different, right? And so Paul is saying to the church in Corinth, and he's also saying this to us, we can be sure that Jesus really rose from the dead, that the resurrection is truth, an actual event, and there were eyewitness accounts that Jesus came back to life, and it changes everything. This is the gospel, the good news, and we believe it, and we stand on it, and we hold firmly to it. Paul tells the Corinthians, this is what you believed in. But remember, now, he's dealing with a mess here. So what's he talking about? They believe that Jesus rose from the dead. They stand on it. They're holding firmly to that. But they didn't believe that they would also be resurrected that they too would have a bodily resurrection when Jesus comes back. And so that's the second part we want to look at, the resurrection for the rest of us. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 12. Verse 12, it says, But if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead? If there's no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. Now, Paul gets pretty logical, and he begins to reason with them. 
using logic and reason and helping them understand the truth of not only Jesus resurrected, but our resurrection. Our faith is anchored in this resurrection event. Without it, what are we doing? Paul says, why, why are we doing this? Our, our lives uh, and what we're saying and what we're doing out here is, is in vain. Why, why worship? Why, why gather? Why preach? But not only the resurrection of Jesus, but our eventual resurrection. Every week when we take communion, we celebrate what Jesus did for us on the cross. We take the body, uh, the bread that represents his body, the, the cup that represents his blood. Every time we do that, we're reminded of the cross and the resurrection, the gospel we should be reminded that this life is not the end of things, that we too will rise someday. Verse 15 says, More than that, we are then found to be false witnesses about God, for we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead. But he did not raise him if in fact the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Then those who, all, who have also fallen asleep in Christ are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. Now, Paul is connecting, again, the resurrection of Jesus and our resurrection. And maybe some of you didn't understand that. That at the end of our life, that to be absent from the body is to be present with Christ someday. Uh, we will be present with Christ. And at some point when Christ returns... All the dead in Christ will rise. In other words, we'll have immortal bodies. We're going to get to that in just a moment. We're going to be raised from the dead as well, just as Christ was raised from the dead. And so if we're only hoping in this life, our hope is only in Christ for this life, he says, you should feel sorry for us. No, it's, it's about the next life. This is the good news, right? So the, he goes on, verse 20, it says, but Christ has indeed been raised from the dead. The first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as in Adam all died, so in Christ all will be made alive. And so I think it's a good reminder. And Paul reminds the church in, in Corinth and even us today. It gives meaning and direction to our lives and to our faith. To understand that this life is not the end of things. Man, we say that a lot in, at funerals. We, we talk about that this life uh, is, is not the end, that there's this next life, this, this place in glory with God someday. And not only are we going there in, in spirit, but we will also have these bodies, okay? And we're going to get to some really good news because this changes everything. So the idea of the resurrection for the church in Corinth and this mess that's being created, they believed in Jesus resurrected. They didn't understand that they too would be resurrected someday. That they too would have these immortal bodies. And Paul is cleaning up this mess for them. Because what he's saying to them, it matters what you understand about your life, not only in this life, but in the life to come. And it gives you a sense of direction, a true north, if you will, because it changes everything. So what does that mean? Well, look at this third section. In the end, no more mess. Verse 50, Paul writes, he says, I declare to you, brothers and sisters, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. In a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. Paul writes, we will all be changed. When Jesus comes back someday, we will all be changed. Now, we know what perishable things are and imperishable things. You think about fruit and vegetables, how they're subject to rot and decay. They don't last very long, right? And then you got your canned goods, rice and dried beans and things like that, that last a long time. Last I checked, the Twinkie has the longest shelf life, right? I mean, it lasts through everything. But things, things spoil. Things will rot. Things will decay. They're perishable. They won't last a long time. And so when the trumpet sounds, and this is talking about when Jesus returns, when Jesus comes back, those who passed away in Christ, their bodies will be raised, joined with their spirit, imperishable, all right? Those in Christ, those who hold firmly to the gospel will be changed, okay? 
And you think about our bodies right now are subject to decay, right? They, 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 people will tell you that getting old is not for the faint of heart, okay? Is that true? I'm sorry, I can't hear you, right? <laughs> Verse 53, he, he writes, he says, for the perishable, that's us, for the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality. When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, he gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. That's, that's a powerful passage of Scripture. And you look at, let's look at specifically verses 53 and 54. Our bodies, which are perishable, which as we age are prone to breaking down, right? Prone to disease. Prone to failure. And a lot of us fear death, and there's some reasons for that. As we age, as we get older, we, we look at that, those last few decades of our life. We don't expect ourselves to live to this age or that age. Some of you might have fear about that. Getting old, again, is not easy. So in our resurrection, we get new, imperishable, immortal bodies. Thanks be to God. I'm hoping I will never have to diet again. Right? Why aren't you? I mean, the work that goes into maintaining these things, the hardship that at times, the suffering that we go through in these bodies, thanks be to God. Because of Jesus, because of the resurrection of Christ, thanks be to God that you and I are not left to suffer in these bodies, and these bodies are not the end of us, that someday we will be raised in Christ with new, imperishable, immortal bodies. And so when Paul says, where, O death, is your victory, it has none. It doesn't have victory. Where, O death, is your sting, there is no sting of death for those in Christ. Our victory is through our Christ and our Lord. That's the good news. That's the gospel. That's what gives meaning to our life. It gives direction to our life. Helps us deal with the messes in our relationships. Helps, helps us understand and deal with the messes in our churches. Helps us deal with the messes that are in our communities, in our world, because Jesus gives victory over death. That's what this is all about. That's why we do this. And so Paul closes out the chapter here, verse 58. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. So what do we do with all that? Again, I, I would encourage you, read through chapter 15. It's, it's a lot of theology and a lot of good doctrine. It's powerful. But we know that the resurrection of Jesus changes everything. That's what this chapter is about. It changes everything, including me, including us. And so Paul brings this chapter to a very healthy conclusion. He says, therefore, stand firm. Let nothing move you. And so here's the question. What's moved you from your faith in Christ? Let's be honest. There's times where we're moved away that, that we don't stand firm, that we struggle at times in our faith. Maybe it's something that we once had and something has convinced us otherwise. Maybe it's the hardship of this life. Maybe it's uh, some type of education that's moved you away from faith in Christ. Nah, I can't buy it anymore. I don't understand it. I don't want to submit to it. And it's moved us away. Paul says, stand firm. Let nothing move you. In other words, endure. Persevere. The messiness of life comes your way when other teachings and other ideas come your way when the fear of death or hardship crushes your very soul. Stand firm. Let nothing move you. And then he writes in that last verse. It says, always, gives your, always give yourself fully to the American dream. Oh. Always give yourselves fully to your best life yet. 
Nope. Paul says, because of the gospel, because of the resurrection, the resurrection of Jesus and our resurrection someday, give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord. Now, let's face it. Most of us, myself included, work really hard at having the best time in this life, if we're honest. And and I do think that God wants us to enjoy this life. I believe that wholeheartedly. I believe Scripture teaches that. But I think he also desires for us to steward this life, labor in this life for him and for the kingdom. That's what he desires from us. And so if the resurrection of Jesus changes everything, including me, then it matters. Hey, if you're taking notes this morning on the back of your bullet, then there's some spots for you to fill in if you'd like to do that. Then it matters. If the resurrection changes everything, including me, then it matters. First of all, it matters what I believe about Jesus. That I hold firmly to the gospel. And again, a lot of, a lot of, People have come out with all kinds of different ideas about Jesus. I mean, you can trust Hollywood, right? Really? They've got an agenda, a bias. I trust the scriptures. The Old Testament, the New Testament, what it says about Jesus. That's what I hold firmly to. That's what Paul encouraged, commanded the church in Corinth to do. We need to know what the gospel is what Jesus did for us. We need to understand what the gospel does in our lives, what the resurrection does. And we need to submit our lives to it. And so for us to believe, to hold firmly, to stand firm, we need to endure through the messes of this life. And that starts with our faith. So maybe something has moved you away from that. You've moved away from faith in Christ, and it's time to repent and turn and give your life back to Christ. Maybe you need to do that. What I believe about Jesus, it matters. It also matters, second thing, it matters what I do with my body. It matters what I do with it. Now, picture this. If you gave your kids a, if you gave your kid a, a really nice, let's say, hoodie, okay? Like a really nice hoodie. And, and you presented it to them as a gift and, and they put it on and, and let's say about half hour later, you walk outside and your kid has their hoodie and they're changing uh, the, bi- the oil on their bike chain with the hoodie, okay? They're holding the hoodie underneath the chain and putting new oil on the chain there, okay? All right, collecting all the oil and grease. And then, and then they're going to also uh, run around the yard dragging their hoodie behind them through the grass, through the trees, through the dirt and mud and all that stuff. And if you saw that a half hour after giving your son or daughter that hoodie, would you be happy? No. Now, you don't expect the hoodie to last forever, right? You know it's not going to last forever, but you still want them to treat it well and use it the right way. God is the same with our bodies. He's given us these bodies and desires for us to treat them well and use them in the right way. Now, the mess that's going on in Corinth is that they are disconnecting this idea of spirit and body. They're saying, well, your spirit is one thing. Your body isn't really all that important, so you can do whatever you want with it. Not so. These bodies are a gift from God. And he desires us. He knows they're not going to last forever until they are changed forever, made imperishable and immortal. But in the meantime, he desires that we treat them the right way. We use them in the right way. Now, here's why we taught chapter 15 and, uh, today. And, and we're going to get into some things in these next few weeks in this series. Because God has, in his word, instructions on how to treat our bodies. And we're going to talk about that with the weeks to come. But it does matter what I do with my body. Third thing is this. It matters how I live my life. It matters how I live my life. Give ourselves to the working for the Lord, for the kingdom of God. That's what he's called us to. There's this idea of, of the kingdom now and not yet. In other words, when we became Christ followers, when we began to follow Christ and and give our lives to him, when we recognize that the resurrection is everything, 
not just his but ours, we become part of his kingdom as we come into Christ, okay, as we hold firmly to our faith, and we're part of his kingdom right now, right? But we know that this is hard, that we have to endure, that there's things that we'll struggle with, that there's messes that we'll deal with, and that there's a kingdom that is not yet, that someday we will be raised imperishable, immortal. It's going to be awesome, okay? Lots of people love to dream what eternity is like. Like some people say, well, if there's not fishing, you know, or if there's not golf, you know, I I have no idea what eternity is going to be like, but I trust God for it. I trust that it's going to be awesome. Because there's moments in his creation today where I'm like, man, this is great. And if he can do this in seven days, what's what's he getting us ready for in a few thousand years, right? And so I, I want to live my life in such a way that stewards this idea of kingdom. We need to live our lives with the end in mind, with eternity in mind, and recognize that this changes everything. It changes how I treat people. It changes how I live this life. It changes what I steward in this life. Uh, it's going to change everything. So the big question then is, has the resurrection changed you? Has it changed you? Has it reordered your priorities in this life? Has it made a difference? And as we think about the fear of, of, of getting older or the fear of death in this life, losing, uh, losing uh, all kinds of things within our bodies that we once were able to do that we're no longer able to do or hear or see or whatever, Knowing that the resurrection of our own lives is coming, has that changed you? Does it change how you treat your body? And if you're holding firmly onto the gospel and onto Jesus, um, you're you're not going to believe in vain. You're not going to labor in vain. So often, uh, and, and as you read throughout this chapter, there were these negatives that Paul used. He talked about believing in vain, that our faith would be futile or useless, that we would be laboring in vain if none of this was true, that we would be pitiful. People should feel sorry for us if if the resurrection really didn't change things for us. So has the resurrection changed you? And we recognize and we know this, that God God desires us to have faith in his son Jesus, to live this life for him. And maybe you've never stepped across that threshold, or maybe you moved away from it. For whatever reason, it's time to come back. It's time to come back to faith in Christ. And so today, if that's something you need to do, we'd love to meet you in our decision area that's over to my right, your left. We'd love to speak with you about faith in Christ. We'd love to answer any questions that you have, or maybe you're not quite ready yet, but you you just want to talk. You just want somebody maybe to pray with you. Or maybe you're looking for a church home. We'd love to meet with you afterwards. And we want to thank you for being here this morning. Thank you for celebrating VBS, the end of it. Uh, I know many of you were here. And those of you that weren't, uh, next year's VBS is... No, I'm just kidding. We're, we're excited that your kids were able to sing with us today and, and just be praying for these next couple of services as well. Let me pray for us. Let's go ahead and stand. God, we thank you so much for your love. We thank you for your mercy and your grace. We thank you for the resurrection that changed everything. And Father, we know that it wasn't just the resurrection of Jesus that happened. Father, that someday we too will rise. That our bodies will be made imperishable, immortal. That death has lost its sting. And thanks be to you, Father. I know there's people that, Father, with with aging and, and with things in this world that tend to to cripple us or or bring us down in our health or whatever, Father, that some people have this fear. And it's reasonable. Father, in, in our hope in you as we hold firmly to you, as we stand in our faith and in the gospel, give us encouragement today to endure and to persevere in our faith in you. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for the resurrection. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless.